Okay, here is the beginning of chapter one guided notes. What I recommend for these notes is for you to print the blank copy and then fill in notes as you go. But my filled in notes that you'll see here are also posted on Noodle. But I will go quickly so that you can just stop the video as needed and spend more time on certain problems. So here chapter one is on matter and measurements. Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space or has volume. And matter is made up of atoms. So atoms are the building blocks of all matter. Everything around us is made up of these tiny things called atoms. And these atoms are found on the periodic table. So every element indicates a type of atom that is distinct from the others. Another way we talk about matter is what state of matter it's in at a certain time. So there's solid, liquid, and gas. Solid going to liquid is melting. Liquid going to gas is evaporation or boiling. Gas back down to liquid is condensation. And liquid back down to solid is freezing. So we could write those on these arrows. So the characteristics of these three states of matter is solids have a definite shape and volume. So you can't easily change the shape and you can't squish it down. The reason you can't do this is because the molecules are already very closely packed together. They also have a very fixed arrangement. So a solid has a real set pattern of atoms that are in almost a grid-like shape um, and arrangement. Liquids, they still have a definite volume. So you can't squish down the coffee in the coffee mug to fit more coffee. And that's because once again, the molecules are still closely packed together. There's no space for the molecules to be pushed together. However, there is an indefinite shape. So this is because the molecules have freedom to move by one another. They're not in a set fixed arrangement anymore. They now have a random arrangement. Gases, however, they have an indefinite shape and volume, meaning their shape and volume can both be changed very easily. And gases will just adapt to the space that you give them. So Whatever container you put a gas in, its molecules will spread out as much as possible and take up that entire space. So molecules are spread out, there's a random arrangement there. We classify matter by putting it into different categories. So here we can see in this chart, matter can be put into two big categories, pure substances and mixtures. Okay, and then we can further break these down. So let's talk about each one. Pure substances first. What a pure substance is, is a substance with a fixed or constant composition, meaning it will always be the same no matter where you find it. So if you have pure water and nothing else in it, water here will be exactly the same as water in a different lab, as long as it is a pure substance and it is only made up of pure water. These cannot be separated by physical changes. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit, but you have to chemically change a pure substance to get it to break down. Like water, you need to run electricity through it to break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. And that is not a physical change. Physical change would mean that you could just evaporate it. Um, and that would not break down something like water. So if you are a pure substance, you are either an element or a compound. So if you're an element, you are on the periodic table, so that's helpful. And you're made up of all of one kind of atom. So you're just a bunch of copper atoms. You're a bunch of iron atoms, which is Fe. You're a bunch of carbon atoms. So any atom on the periodic table that's all by himself, that would be classified as an element. Additionally though, we're gonna see that there are a few atoms that always exist as pairs when they're by themselves. So you see how I have O2 here written as an example. That's still an element because it still is only composed of oxygen, okay? Same with fluorine. There's, there's two of them put together, but it's still plain old fluorine. So that means it's still an element. And helium was my last example. If elements are put together, then you can make what's called a compound. A compound is also a pure substance. So a compound is a combination of two or more different types of atoms that are together in a fixed ratio. Fixed ratio is super important here, and I'll explain the difference as we go. But a couple of compounds here are water, 
because it's always made up of two H's and one L. Carbon dioxide, because it's one carbon and two oxygens. Carbon monoxide, one and one. SO2, Fe2O3. So you have these set ratios of atoms that are bound together and they are making up what's called a compound. Once again, a compound will be the same no matter what lab you find it in. Okay, so a compound and an element, those are your pure substances. Let's see how they differ from mixtures. Here's mixtures on the other side, and you'll notice that there's two types, homogeneous and heterogeneous. A mixture is a combination of two or more pure substances, but they're in a variable composition. Okay, so you could have two elements, you could have two compounds, you could have a mixture of those, but the big key word here is that it has variable composition. It will not be the same in our lab and someone else's lab. So here we know that it's a variable composition. It also can be separated by physical changes. I'll further explain that. So here, if you had salt water, for example, that would be a mixture because you have salt, which is NaCl, that's a compound, and you have water, H2O, which is a compound. So if you put salt and water together, you're mixing them. Hopefully it's clear that the two things are not binding together to make a new compound. They're just both in the same mixture now. And it will have variable composition because if we all made salt water in the lab, mine would have a different composition than yours. Meaning the ratio is not set anymore. That's what makes it a mixture. If you're a heterogeneous mixture, that means you are not uniform throughout. So if you were to look at the beaker of your solution, it would not be the same from top to bottom. So sand and water, think about those two things. If you tried to mix them up, no matter what you did, the sand would always settle down at the bottom and there would not be uniform composition there. So that would be a heterogeneous mixture. Noodle soup would be another example. Every bite is not gonna be the same. Whereas homogeneous might be more like tomato soup because tomato soup has a, cons a uniform composition. So here's homogeneous mixture. It is uniform from top to bottom. So if you make salt water, all the salt has dissolved, we can assume. From top to bottom, it will be a constant or uniform composition. Your tea should be uniform. The top should taste the same as the bottom. Um, or tomato soup, like I mentioned, every bite should be the same. Another homogeneous mixture is brass. So brass is made up of two elements, copper and zinc, but the two have not been bound together in a set ratio. If they had, then it would be a compound. But because the two have just been melted together and then solidified, this is a mixture because they can have variable compositions. One company might make brass that's heavier with copper, copper, another may make it heavier with zinc. That means it has a variable composition and it is a mixture. Air is another example of a homogeneous mixture. This one can be debated, but if you think about within a room, the air should be fairly uniform. You know, you don't sit at the front of a classroom to get better oxygen because within that room, the air is generally homogeneous. If you were to look at the earth as a whole, air would be heterogeneous because it would be different one country to the next. Um, but we will classify air as a homogeneous mixture because within a given sample, it should be the same throughout. So here's a few practice ones you can run through. Properties, physical versus chemical properties. Physical properties are things that you can see and smell um, about a substance. So you don't have to change the substance in order to see these. So physical properties include density, because you can get the mass and you can get the volume without changing color, melting and boiling points, solubility, how well does it dissolve in water or another solvent. Chemical properties, however, you can only see them when you change the substance. So are they flammable? Well, to see that property, you need to burn it and therefore you're changing the substance. How does it react with an acid? How does it react with a base? Is it corrosive? Will it rust? Those are chemical properties. Intensive and extensive properties. Intensive is independent of the amount of the substance. So 
one good example of this is density because no matter how much of a substance you have, it'll still have the same mass to volume ratio. Extensive properties, however, depend on the amount of a substance, so mass or volume. The more you have, the more mass you'll have, the more volume you'll have. But the ratio, which is density, that will stay constant. Physical versus chemical changes. So physical changes is when you change a substance without changing its identity. So for example, if you just melt ice, you have not changed the composition of the substance. All you've done is taken the water molecules and made them move past one another, but you haven't changed the H2O into another compound. So that's a physical change. Melting, boiling, any type of phase change. Dissolving something, if you dissolve salt into water, that is just a physical change. You still have salt and you still have water. And then filtration, if you try to filter something to keep um, sand from the water, you're purely just filtering the two. You're not changing anybody's identity. These can be used to separate mixtures, whereas chemical changes are needed to separate um, a compound or break a compound up. You have to actually break bonds, change the substance into something different. So take water, and break it into hydrogen and oxygen gas. Examples are burning or combustion, cooking something like eggs, reacting something with acid. Any kind of reaction would be a chemical change. Separation of mixtures, once again, you can separate mixtures using physical changes. And so distillation is one example where really all you're trying to do is boil off something. So if you cook with wine, you put the wine in and you boil it, Alcohol is boiling off before the water. So the alcohol is actually being boiled out. And that means you're separating two substances in a mixture that have different boiling points. So here, most alcohol has a melting point of around 78, 80 degrees, whereas water doesn't boil to 100. So if you get that mixture to around 78 degrees, alcohol boils off, water stays there, and now you have separated the mixture. Same with salt water. You could boil salt water, the water would boil off and it would leave the salt behind. Filtration is another way you can separate mixtures. You separate a solid from a liquid using some type of filter. Chromatography we talked the least about, but it's a technique that separates mixtures based on different solubilities. So all of those techniques can be used to separate mixtures, not to separate pure substances. Your substances require chemical changes to separate them.